Hello and welcome to the section of the Trig and Precalculus Tutor Volume 2. Uh, here we're going to continue working with these fundamental trig identities, the trig rainbow so to speak, and to solve additional problems. Now all of the problems we're going to do in this set of, uh, in this lesson here, uh, require only what's written on the board here. So we're not really introducing any new identities here, we're just working more problems to get comfortable with these identities. So for the first problem, what we have is cosecant of x over secant of x is equal to cotangent x. Now there's a couple things I want to say before we solve this problem. First of all, notice that it's cosecant x, secant x, cotangent x. There's x's everywhere. There's no thetas. That uh, upsets a lot of students at first because you're, you're conditioned by now to know that all of these trig functions, they operate on angles. And angles are almost always written with a theta when you're talking in trig. So people look at x and they're like, why is x in there? You know what, when you see uh, any variable, anything listed uh, in a trig function like that, you kind of just need to ignore it. It's using the variable, it's just, a variable can be anything. I mean, we're using uh, thetas here, we're using x's here. I could use a, b, or c, or whatever I want to. It's just like algebra. I can use any variable I want. So whatever this variable is labeled, it is an angle, right? It has to be an angle. So whatever you're operating on, just kind of keep in the back of your mind that it doesn't really matter what letter it is or what Greek letter we use, it's an angle. And so those, those uh, trig functions are operating on an angle. So don't get too wrapped up in what we're using. Sometimes we'll use x's, sometimes we'll use theta, sometimes we'll use alphas and betas and x's and y's. It doesn't matter. To you, it's just a dummy variable. You just kind of carry it through the problem, all right? Uh, and the second thing is that everything needed to solve this guy is presented in what we already have here. So what we're trying to do is beat the left hand side of this uh, identity into a cotangent and prove that it's equal to a cotangent. Now one more piece of advice I'll give you as we're starting early in the course. You're almost always, especially when we get into more advanced problems, you're almost always not going to be able to do this in your head. A lot of students will look at an identity and they'll freeze up because they'll say, well, I don't know how to make it equal to a cotangent. I don't see it. I mean, even if I do some stuff, I don't see how it can be equal to cotangent. You know, it's kind of like solving an algebra problem when you, when you used to do that and that was really new and different to you, right? I mean, you didn't really know how you, or how the answer would look. You didn't really know that it was going to be 2.5 for an answer. You had to move this over to one side, divide by here, whatever factor, whatever you had to do. And then finally you get to the answer, but you know that every step you did in those algebra problems were legal. So when you get to the answer, you know the answer's correct. Same thing with these trig things. You're not going to be able to see, I mean this one's kind of simple, so maybe some of you can, but, but you're not going to in general be able to see how to make it equal the right hand side. You just need to take legal, logical, bite-sized little steps that you know are, are absolutely correct, and then beat it slowly into shape. Eventually you're going to reach a step where you're going to say, oh. Well, that's equal to cotangent, and then you get the answer. But don't try to stare at the paper and figure it all out without writing anything down. So when you look at something like this, you may not know how to start, because you may not know what you, first of all, you look at cosecant over here, and say, well, cosecant's one over sine, and you look at secant, and you say, well, secant's involving a cosine, how's that equal to a cotangent? You may not see how that works out. So you just do what you know is true. And then you see if the rest of it's going to fall out. So cosecant, if you look at your trig rainbow, cosecant is 1 over sine, right? So on the top of this big fraction, I'm going to write 1 over sine of x. I'm going to put a big fraction bar for here. Secant, we look over to secant. Secant is 1 over cosine. So I'm going to write a 1 over cosine x there. And that's, you know, usually it's, you just carry the equal sign through on the right hand side, but really I think the easiest, cleanest way to do it is just work on the left hand side until you get the left hand side down to the answer. And then you just carry that the, the right hand side comes down with it rather than cluttering up your paper, copying the right hand side over and over. You know what you're doing, you're setting it equal to this. All right, so how do you get this into shape? You might look at that and say, well, I have no idea. But then you realize that these, this is a fraction divided by another fraction. Right? So you don't throw out all the other rules of math that you know. If you have one half and you're dividing it by three fourths, how do you do that? I mean, you learned a long time ago that all you do is you take the top guy and you multiply it by the bottom flipped over. So it's four thirds, 
now you multiply and you simplify and you get the answer. That's not that important. What I'm trying to say is when you have something divided by a fraction, you just take the numerator and you change it to multiplication and you take the denominator and flip it over. You flip it up and multiply. This comes from basic math. So we're going to do basically the same thing here. We're going to take our numerator, sine of x, and we're going to change this division to multiplication. We're going to take our denominator, flip it over, and multiply. Cosine of x over 1. This is legal, not because it's a math trick, it's because we are dealing with fractions. You know, a lot of students, they'll, they'll do identities and they'll say, well, I never would have thought of that. That's a math trick, right? How did he do that? Well, that's not a math trick. That's fractions, right? So you learn all of these skills growing up. You don't need to throw them away. If you need to deal with fractions, deal with the fractions the same way that you always have. And believe me, if, if this is confusing or you don't remember this stuff, go back and review fractions a little bit because it'll save you. Okay, so what we have here, just to kind of make sure it's absolutely clear, when we do this multiplication, we multiply the numerators. We get cosine of x. We multiply the denominators. We get sine of x. Now this should start to look familiar. Cosine over sine, we already talked about that. Cosine over sine is actually equal to the cotangent function. Much like sine over cosine is equal to tangent, cosine over sine is equal to cotangent. So on the left we have cotangent x. On the right we started with this, we just dropped that down, cotangent x. We have proven that this uh, identity does hold. So we have cotangents equal to cotangent. So again, we just substitute stuff in. We don't necessarily see how it's going to go and equal the right-hand side. We're, we get to there and we're like, hmm, what do we do? Then we just deal with the fractions and then we realize, oh, that's how it equals. So don't try to go from here all the way to the end in your head because even though you might be able to see this one, when we get to more complicated relations and complicated um, identities to prove, you're almost certainly not going to be able to jump from here to here uh, in your head. All right, the next problem is sine of theta plus cosine of theta over cosine of theta is equal to 1 plus tangent theta. So again, we know that this is true. We know that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. We just need to kind of prove that it's true by changing the left-hand side and slowly manipulating it to equal this. Now this is a great example of one where I really doubt many people watching this video are going to be able to look at the left hand side and somehow like do substitutions in their head and make it equal the right hand side. I mean I couldn't do that when I first looked at it. I mean I, it's not something that you're just like born with. You need to sort of take it one step at a time and prove it to be true. Right? So you know you look at this particular one this looks a little tricky at first because well you know your first thought is okay Cosine. I know how to change cosines uh, into secants, but that doesn't really help me because there's no secants over here. So that kind of makes me stuck. I know how to take these sines, right here, sine, and I know how to change him into cosecants. But that doesn't really help me because there's no cosecants on the right hand side. So this is a great example when a lot of students would freeze up because they don't know what to do. If you try to substitute in, it doesn't really get any simpler. So you might call this a math trick, but really it's just a, uh, it's just dealing with fractions, and you'll see how it's going to help you here. What we need to do is basically split this fraction up. This is a giant fraction. It's got a very large numerator, uh, and it's got a, a denominator there. What we're going to do is rewrite the left-hand side in a way that's going to help us. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to write it as sine of theta over cosine of theta plus cosine of theta over cosine of theta. What I'm telling you is the left, this whole left hand side is equal to whatever he written it as here. And you might say, well, how the heck did he do that? But if you think about it, if you go in reverse, it is true. What if I, you know, what if I covered this up and I gave you this and I said, hey, here's a fraction. Add those guys together. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to say, well, is there a common denominator? And you're going to say, yes, cosine of theta is a common denominator. So I'm going to keep that as a common denominator in my final answer, which is here. Since I have a common denominator, I can add the numerators. So sine plus cosine, well, I can't really add them, so I just keep it as sine plus cosine, right? This is exactly the same thing as, you know, 3 plus 4 over 5, right? Now, of course, I can make it 7, but just to illustrate the point, 3 plus 4 over 5. It's the same thing as 3 over 5 plus 4 over 5. 
we know that we can keep the common denominator and we add the numerators together. So we're, we're used to dealing with fractions when we have two fractions together and we combine them to a single fraction, we call it adding fractions, right? But the reverse is true. You can take a single fraction and you can break them up if it helps you. So since we don't really know what else to do with substituting, we just try to break this fraction up and see if it helps us, okay? So that's how we get to the step here. Now, let's continue on. What is sine over cosine? You should know by now that sine over cosine is tangent. So we have tangent theta on the left. What is cosine over cosine? Well, anything divided by itself uh, is one. So we have plus one right here. And notice that we're pretty much equal to the right-hand side. Let's flip it around just to make it absolutely, absolutely equal. And then we come down here with one plus tangent theta. Now you see how a problem that looks very, very complicated becomes very easy once you kind of hit the right, uh, the right little step. And that's why trig and trig identities can sometimes seem confusing and daunting. It's because students sometimes will look at the answer and say, well, I never would have thought of that. Believe me, I didn't know how to do this stuff when I was born. You need to practice it. So now I've taught you that when you see a big fraction, that it's perfectly legal to split it up into smaller fractions. Now one, I'll tell you one little piece of intuition that'll help you later on. I know that I'm going from a big fraction to two smaller things. Now granted, this doesn't look like a fraction or a fraction, but you know that in the end, you've got two things added together and you kind of come from a big thing. So you know that splitting up that big thing on the left-hand side is probably gonna be a good idea because eventually I've got two things that are split apart from each other on the other side. So it doesn't tell you for sure that that's the right way to go, but it tells you that it probably won't hurt you to split this up if you can, because you know in the, in the end, on the other side, everything's split up, right? So that's kind of like intuition, but ultimately, you're just going to have to kind of work some of these problems to kind of get comfortable with knowing what to do. Um, and you know, no matter what, that what you're doing is legal. Splitting this up like this is absolutely legal. And once you get into this form, you're like, oh, here's where the one comes from. And once you get to this step, you say, oh, here's where the one comes from, and here is where the tangent comes from. And then by the time you get to this point, you see that the, the problem becomes trivial. So if you're staring at a trig uh, identity problem that you're trying to solve, and you don't know what to do, what you need to do is do something. Do something that you know is legal, even if you don't see how it's gonna get you to the answer. And then you inch your way forward, and then eventually you'll get to a point where you say, oh, I get it, this is the right path. And you go on from there. All right, so for our next problem, we have tangent of t plus cosine of t over sine of t is equal to secant of t plus cotangent of t. Now, before we actually simplify this, I wanna point out something. Again, notice we're using t's instead of thetas. I told you that we might use any any letter uh, in the alphabet or any Greek letter to, to, to represent in these problems, right? I told you that already. But T's become especially troubling because T looks an awful lot like a plus. So if you're not careful, your T's are gonna be mixed around with your pluses and it's gonna get ugly looking if you're not careful. I would like you to get in the habit, when you write plus, like addition, it looks like a straight cross, right? Like a down and over. When you write t as part of a variable or even as part of like t and cotangent, you need to put a hook on the bottom. Just get in the habit of, of doing it like that. Hook on the bottom, hook on the bottom, hook on the bottom, hook on the bottom, hook on the bottom. I know it looks a little weird at first, but trust me, it's going to help you because when you see the hook, you realize, okay, that's a variable. And when you see the plus, you realize that's addition. And so you don't get confused by those things because if you, if you squeeze all this stuff together, you're going to have a lot of t's running together and it's going to get confusing. Now again, we have a large fraction on the left and we have something on the right. Uh, we have them split up into two quantities. So we don't know for sure, because uh, there's lots of ways to solve a problem, but we know that it's probably not a bad idea to try to split this giant fraction up on the left-hand side. Because in the end, we need to have something split up on the right-hand side. So Let's do that. How would we split this left-hand fraction up? Well, the common denominator is sine of t. So the first part will be tangent of t over sine of t. I've got a plus sign from here, and then I have cosine of t over sine 
T. And you need to stare at that and make sure that you agree that those two guys on the left hand side, that they're equal to each other. And the easiest way to do that is to go in reverse and say, well, if I'm adding these together, common denominators here, adding the top is what gets me here. That is legal, right? And now I have two things broken apart, which hopefully will simplify to what I have over here. So tangent over sine, tangent over sine. Um, there's not like a, a pre-built identity to help you with this, so we just need to kind of bust it out. What is tangent equal to? Tangent, you should remember, is sine of t over cosine of t. And if you forget, we wrote it down on the board over here. Tangent sine over cosine. That's one that you're going to remember. On the bottom, we have sine of t. Now we could go over here and say, oh, sine, we're going to rewrite it in terms of cosecant, but that wouldn't help me because I, I'm rewriting the numerator in terms of sines and cosines. Ultimately, I want to simplify this, so I'm going to leave the bottom in terms of a sine, right? You don't want to change everything over so that you can't do any cancellations. All right, now over here for our next term, cosine over sine, does that look familiar to you? Cosine over sine, we wrote as cotangent, cotangent t. Now you think you might be on the right track here because notice on the right hand side we have secant plus cotangent. We've got our cotangent in the bag, right? So all we have to do is beat this into shape and then we're basically finished. So what do we have here? We have sine over cosine over sine, but don't forget, since this is a number on the bottom of a fraction, it's kind of like sine of t over one. So this is a fraction divided by another fraction. So on the left, what you really have is sine of t over cosine of t. Big, fra well, let me take away the big fraction, actually. Change this fraction into multiplication, take the denominator, flip it over to multiply, one over sine t. This comes straight from fraction math. This is not trigonometry. This is fraction divided by fraction. You flip the bottom one over and multiply. That's what we've done here. We still have the plus cotangent of t. We carry that along for the ride. Now sine of t divided by sine of t, when you, you know, simplify this fraction here, you've got a sine on the top and a sine on the bottom, so it's going to cancel. And on the left, what you're simply going to have is 1 over cosine of t and of course this comes along for the ride, cotangent of t, one over cosine, one over cosine. Look at your trig rainbow, one over cosine is equal to secant. One over cosine is equal to secant. So one over cosine is equal to secant. So we have secant of t plus cotangent of t, and that's exactly equal to what we were given with here. So equals secant t plus cotangent the final line in every single trig identity problem should be the left hand side manipulated down to a point, the right hand side carried down, so that at the end of the day you can see the left hand side is exactly equal to the right hand side. So we have solved a few more trig identity problems that deal with what we call these fundamental trig identities. These identities that are so incredibly important that I really do want you to remember them. But I don't want you to remember them by writing all these down and kind of like just trying to memorize a table. I want you to remember them by using this trig rainbow. And I, I meant it when I said that when I solve any problem with trig, I write that rainbow down almost immediately to remember how the identities work, right? Tangent being sine over cosine, you're just going to have to remember. But honestly, you will remember that. Uh, pretty easily. And cotangent's easy because it's kind of like the flipped over version of the tangent. These really are some of the only ones that I'm going to say you really need to remember in some sort of fashion. Most of the other identities are things that are just going to be given to you and there will be things that you'll use. Some of them you'll remember, some of them you won't, but you know they're not going to be things that you necessarily have to remember. But these guys are so important that that's why we call them fundamental. You will pretty much need to remember them in some way or another. If you can remember that, fine. I find it easier to remember this. So, I'm Jason with MathTutorDVD.com. Make sure you understand this section. Watch it again if you need to. Play it again. Solve these exact problems we're doing over again. When you're done with that, go to your uh, Trigger Precal book or some other geometry book. Grab some more identities and prove that they are true. The nice thing about them is that you always know if you're right because the answer is basically given to you in the problem statement. You need to logically be able to work your way to the end to get these guys right. So make sure you master this and then follow me on to the next section where we'll continue learning these absolutely essential core trig identities and how to work with them.